a scandalous diary, the grand tours of Anna Jameson. My husband and I were late to the travel bar, but we did, uh, in the end, catch the travel bar. And as I said, I'm just, just recently back from Crete, and that's uh, one of our walks. That's on the southern coast of Crete, and that is, just behind there, is where the Cyclops Polyphemus was supposed to have had his cave, where Odysseus um, plotted a raid on his cave. And, and it's also the coast where the bronze giant Talos uh, hurl rocks at Jason and the Argonauts, so it's, it's a very evocative scene. The first time my husband and I went to Rome in 2012, I loved it, but I came away confused because if you've been to Rome, it's not like touring in Britain where everything is signposted and there's free, clean toilets everywhere. Rome's not like that. <laughs> Rome expects you to do the work. And long after I got back, I realised that the best guidebook to Rome had actually appeared in 1871. Written by Augustus Hare. Now, could I just get a show of hands as to who is familiar with Augustus Hare? Good on your mic. Okay, well, please let me convey you the great joy of getting to know Augustus Hare. He was one of the great English Victorian eccentrics, and his autobiography, which came out in six volumes, uh, has actually also come out in a shorter version, which I highly recommend. Very strange man, but early in his life he found his calling, which was to write guidebooks. He had a contract with John Murray to produce guidebooks first in Britain and then in the continent. And uh, as you can see, his Walks in Rome, Volume 1, um, and that edition there is the 17th edition. So you can see how popular these guidebooks were. And one of the reasons why Augustus' book is so good is that it tells you what previous travellers thought and said about Rome. So if you want to know what Goethe, shown here, uh, in the Roman Campania, which is that, uh, as it was, great expanse of uh, open country north of Rome, it's now completely built over, but this is Goethe, uh, what, it, what Madame de Stael said about Rome, what Felix Mendelssohn, the great composer and performer, said about Rome, uh, what Nathaniel Hawthorne, the great American novelist and diplomat, what he'd written about Rome. And finally, this was how I was introduced to Anna James, because Augustus tells, tells you in a, a, quite a few long quotes what Anna Jameson has to say about Rome. Now, Anna Jameson, uh, the, the, the parts that Augustus was quoting were her famous works of art history, which came later, but then I realised that her first published work was a very different publication. It was called The Diary of an Ennuyé, and it came out anonymously in 1826. Okay, so Anna Murphy, as she then was, was born in 1794 in Dublin. Her father, Dennis Murphy, was a miniature painter. And from time to time, he would go travelling and try to get contracts for painting miniatures. Uh, and uh, taking Anna uh, with his, for his first move to Britain, um, her biographer had said this contributed to Anna's sense of being a special kind of person. In Anna's uh, own words, we have her reminiscences. I had the usual desire to know and the usual dislike to learn, the usual love of fairy tales and hatred of French exercise. It was the intense sense of beauty which gave the first verse to poetry. I loved it, not because it told me what I did not know, but because it helped me to words in which to clothe my own knowledge and perception. And this is uh, a famous portrait of Anna in her youth by her, from a miniature that her father did. Now, uh, it's quite unusual for us to have a kind of a literary autobiography for women writers of this time. And wouldn't it be wonderful if we had Austen's own literary autobiography rather than the, you know, the uh, rather haphazard versions of her brother Henry, first of all, and then James Edward Austen Lee later on? Wouldn't it be great if we had Austen's own account of her literary influences? Unfortunately, we don't. But um, Harriet Martineau, another great a uh, woman writer of the mid 19th century encouraged Anna Jameson to give this kind of literary autobiography. She says, I remember impressions of vice and cruelty from some parts of the Old Testament and Goldsmith's History of England, which I show to recall. 
Uh, and Gold's Musician was also a text that Austen read as a girl because we know uh, her, her family copy was annotated in the Marjorie Party. Shakespeare was forbidden to Anna, but <laughs> I read him through between seven and ten years old. <laughs> He never did me any moral mischief. What was exceptional and coarse in language, I passed by without attaching any meaning whatever to it, though the witch is in my best trouble then. Uh, she was lent by a scholarly parish clerk, uh, the Odyssey and the Iliad. But there were also some texts that were kind of anti formative, and these were the evangelical tracts of Hannah Moore. These so called pious tracts first introduced me to a knowledge of the vices of vulgar life and the excitements of a vulgar religion. The fear of being hanged and the fear of hell became coexistent in my mind. And the teaching resolved itself into this, that it was not by being naughty but by being found out that I was to incur the risk of both. Now, uh, Anna started when she was still very young to be the teacher of her younger sisters. So Anne was in training to be a governess, and she worked hard at her languages as well as teaching her sisters. She was also, of course, a young writer, and it's interesting to compare her juvenilia, such as it survives, with Austen's. And this is a letter that she sent to her father. I take the opportunity of sending you a little effusion, which has been ready written since the last parcel went off. I'm not quite satisfied with it myself. I hope you will resolve me a few questions in the first verse, whether I should say, Thy form I spied, or Thy bloom I spied. How should I correct it? I also use the word flower a great deal too often. And we do have a little bit of her surviving juvenilia. This is a poem written on the occasion of the uh, Battle of Trafalgar. With fame and victory following in his train, Collingwood views his native land again to songs of praise each. Joyous heart is strung, and happiness resounds from every tongue. So it's pretty cliche, I have to say. But she was very young. Uh, she early made plans to take her sisters from Newcastle on a plan of running away to Scotland. Uh, later on, she had a plan of taking the whole family over to Brussels, and all the girls would learn lace making to help support the family. But only when young Louisa and Camilla got cold feet was the plan discovered. So Anne could be seen. Uh, there was a protector of her sisters, or as a chief leader astray. By the age of 16 and 1810, she was ready to go out as a governess. And the first thing that she went to was, as it happens, a family in Austin's own county of Hampshire. Uh, it was the Marquis of Winchester, a very exalted uh, family. Uh, the Powlets, uh, still uh, the same family still in possession, I think it's pronounced Paulet nowadays. Uh, and that's their coat of arms. And so Anna had the job of educating her four little boys from nine down to five. Can you imagine? It must be chaos. Uh, around the same time, Dennis, her father, was appointed miniature painter uh, to Princess Charlotte, which was quite a, distinctive, a distinguished job. Now, as we know, of course, from Austin and other writers, uh, a governess's life was very difficult. Uh, of course, it comes up in Austin's fiction. Miss Taylor transcends the role of governess in becoming Mrs. Weston. And of course, Jane Fairfax uh, regards the role as, uh, um, what did she say, the sale of human intellect. And, and that's very strong language for anyone, certainly for Jane Fairfax. And the prospect of being trafficked in a position by Mrs. Elton is particularly humiliating. Uh, of course, we have Austin's friend Anne Sharp, the governess at Godmersham, became a real friend. Uh, in 1847, Anne Bronte, of course, under the name Acton Bell, uh, would publish Agnes Grey, which is a novel but very closely based in fact, uh, which showed the drudgery, the be at best, and, uh, drudgery at best, and at worst, domestic tyranny from both children and their families. Now, Anne Jameson herself, actually, in 1846, was to publish a highly important essay on the subject called Of Mothers and Governesses. And as part of that essay, Jameson points out one of the key problems. This mutual contract, which is an unequal contract, she says, not only involves an inequality, it involves a contradiction. The relationship with, which exists between the governess and your employer either places a woman of education and of superior faculties in an ambiguous and inferior position, 
with none of the privileges of a recognized profession, such as men have, or it places a vulgar, half-educated woman in a situation of high responsibility, requiring superior endowments. In either of these cases, the result cannot be good. And it's a wonderful essay because Jameson um, takes the point of view, first of all, of mothers who are engaged in a governess in their family and what they need to consider, and she then has a section on what the governess themselves need to consider going into this kind of role. And her advice is so good. It, it, it's got wider application to so many roles. And she actually says, uh, for a young governess going, going into your family, make your own health the number one priority. <laughs> because she had seen so many uh, governesses burn out for the, for within a short time. So she stayed four years with the bullets and apparently gave satisfaction, but she herself was quite exhausted by that time. Uh, writing to her mother, my mind is not well. I feel as if it was stretched beyond its strength, as if a little repose would save me, my head at least. And then there's uh, four years that were a blank in the biography, and then she goes to another family, the roles of Bradbourne Park in Kent, which unfortunately I couldn't find a picture of, but they have been demolished. Uh, and it was with the Rolleses that Anna was able to go on her first tour to Europe. So that highly ambiguous and difficult position of governess could have its compensations. And uh, well, in her um, article, written much later, Anna gives advice to both the mother and the governess, don't become friends. But obviously Anna really wasn't aware of that at this stage because obviously Mrs Rolles tried to cultivate her. Mrs Rolles is extremely kind and even affectionate. We are almost inseparable companions and begin to know each other better. It is clear that I am becoming rather a favourite and I will try and keep up my credit and make it short. Uh, around the same time, Anna arranged that Louisa and the, uh, would stay in Paris. Louisa was to uh, improve her own qualifications to be a governess by improving her French and other skills. But Anna, as we know from her letters, was practising the most severe economy herself. She was with this incredibly rich family that she just thought basically was pinching and scraping in order to pay for her laundry. Um, and then we, we have the entry for uh, in the letter tonight to go to the opera, at least Mrs Rolls goes, and I have some hopes of going too. And then they go to Rome. I visited St Peter's three times, the Vatican twice, the Pantheon, the Capitol, the Colosseum, the Forum, the Pillars of Antine, that's Marcus Aurelius, and Trajan, the Borghese, the Cothini, the Barberini, Palaces, and last of all, the Pope in his pontifical uh, splendour in the chapel of the Quirinal Palace. A good week's work, as Mr. Rolls calls it. <laughs> fun, fun digression here, if you'll permit me. So that is a picture, an engraving of the Forum from 1850. Now, if you've been to the Forum in Rome, it's just jam-packed with temples, buildings, uh, there you can see it's basically completely unexcavated except for this column down the front. And so, <laughs> to get the history of that, we have to have a, a little, another little impression. Um, I'm not sure what grand tour ladies we're going to be talking about today, but one of the grandest of the grand tour ladies was uh, Bess, Bess Foster, uh, the great friend of Georgiana, Duchess of Devonshire, and after Georgiana's death, um, Bess married uh, the Duke, <laughs> so they were inseparable uh, while uh, while they were, while Georgiana was living, and then Bess took over with the Duchess. Uh, and then after her husband died in 1816, Bess moved to Rome, and she personally funded and organised uh, one of the earliest excavations in the Forum, revealing the sixth-century column of Phocas. That's a little one in the front of that engraving. A striking monument to a very forgettable prince. <laughs> and here he is looking forgettable, and that's his column above. <laughs> so it, it turned out to be one of the later uh, monuments, and that's obviously why it was sticking up out of the ground, and that's why it was the first thing to be excavated. But for decades after that, that was all you could see in the forum. So the next family that Anna uh, stayed with was the Littletons. Uh, with, again, a hugely wealthy family. Uh, and she became a great favourite and very attached to the eldest daughter. Uh, and at this time she was uh, writing dramas and verse for children, but she didn't have any illusions about the little angels in her care. Uh, there are two damn lookers on peeping over my shoulder or I would say more. 
Now, around this time, um, Anna's writing got to a wider audience. Her father, Dennis, had prepared some miniatures based on a series of paintings from the 17th century by Peter Lely of the ladies of Charles II's court, and they were called the Wings of Beauties. Uh, you can still see them, still in the Royal Collection. But Dennis hadn't been able to get a buyer for his miniature versions, and so Anna decided she would uh, make a written work based on them. And in fact, her essays appeared in Richard Bentley's New Monthly Magazine in 1826. And we know, of course, Richard Bentley from his role in the Austin publication history. It was a very enterprising publisher. Now, for this um, set of essays, Anna borrowed this quasi male gallant persona. Fair ladies all, I kiss your fair hands. It's the kind of thing that, that appears in the essays. So, again, just around this time, uh, Anna, after some years of courtship, married Robert Jameson, who was a lawyer and a, quite a figure in the London literary scene. Anna did not go into the marriage with any illusions at all. She wrote to her mother, I have the firm conviction that there exists a disparity between our minds and characters which will render it impossible for me to be quite happy with him. Uh, and they were two very strong little people and clashes soon began. However, he did encourage her to write uh, her first full length book. So this was the diary of an ennuyé. What's impressive about it is that it's, it's a fictional diary based on her trips with her families. We've got to remember that at this period, the fictional diary, which we kind of take for granted as a genre of literature, didn't exist. Uh, and even the um, genuine diaries of people like Samuel Pepys and John Evelyn, the great classic male diaries, had only recently been published. So what Anne was doing here was, was absolutely groundbreaking. Uh, so she played with the gender and the identity of the author and the editor. There's supposedly a, a, a male editor who found this manuscript. As a real picture of natural and feminine feeling, the editor hopes that it may interest others as much as it has interested him. The asterisks marks the places where one or more leaves have been torn away by the writer and where there may sometimes appear a want of continuity. So that's one of these ways that you can, uh, you can, you can lend verisimilitude as if it really is a diary with pages torn out. Of course, that's not the case. And Anne later wrote, she was quite conscious of what she was doing. The intent was not to create an illusion by giving the fiction the appearance of truth, but in fact to give to truth the air of fiction. And this is in her opening paragraphs. Calais, June 21st. What young lady travelling for the first time on the continent does not write a diary? No sooner have we slept on the shores of France, no sooner have we seated in the gay salon at Dessin, than we call like Biddy Fudge for French pens and French ink, and four steps from its case and a rocker bound diary, regularly ruled in page, with its patent Brahma lock and key, wherein we are to record and observe all the striking, profound, and original observations, the classical reminiscences, the threadbare raptures, the poetical effusions, in short, all the never sufficiently to be exhausted topics of sentiment and enthusiasm, which must necessarily suggest themselves while posting from Paris to Naples. And this is a picture of a patent and Brahma lock. So obviously, um, Brahma was a firm that specialised in these locks, and this was one from the 1780s, and the firm offered a reward for anyone who could pick the lock, and apparently it wasn't picked for another 20 years. So they obviously um, had been a good name for these, uh, these sure locks, which were attached to some of, the, some of these ladies' diaries. Um, so, she also took on the persona of someone suffering from an undefined illness. We have all read the diary of an invalid, the best of all diaries since old England. Well then, here begins the diary of a blue devil. Now, blue devil is a, an expression for depression, uh, it comes up in Byron, uh, so, but again, it was quite new at that time. And her reference here is the diary of an invalid by Henry Matthews from 1821. Now, <laughs> The Diary of an Invalid is um, quite a different kind of book. Henry Matthews, uh, obviously his money was no object for him. He was meeting old Etonians in his travels around Europe. And he had the great idea of getting a coat in order to have fresh milk on his journey from uh, Portugal to Italy. But then he got so seasick that he realised that the fresh milk was no use uh, or the goat was a good travel companion. 
<laughs> so Nancy exhibits uh, no self-knowledge and no sense of irony, whereas Anna's diary of Wiener has both in spades. So who is this bored lady, this ennuyé? We never really find out. She seems to have considerable freedom of movement. She's got a kind of shifting cast of companions, male and female. Senator Man, June 27, I cannot bear this place. Another hour and it will kill me. This sultry evening, this sickening sunshine, this quiet, unbroken, boundless landscape. These motionless woods, the sand stealing, creeping through the level plains, the dull grandeur of the old chateau, the languid repose of the whole scene instead of soothing torture. So that's Saint Germain from earlier in the 18th century. And then we have these references to, in this case, S. Well, who, who's S? We never really find out who S is, except we kind of get the picture he must be the love interest. And so we have, you know, quite a few effusions like this about what S might be thinking. And there's someone called Edmond who turns up just to be amusing at one stage, and I don't think we ever see Edmond again. Uh, Edmond's come to pull me the the desert we had to, to entertain me, stop me being bored and fatigued. We talked as usual of women, of gallantry, of the French and English character, of national prejudices, of Shakespeare and Racine, never failing subjects of discussion. And he read aloud Delisle's Catacombe de Rome with great feeling, animation, and dramatic effect. It's kind of weird thinking that uh, an account of the catacombs of Rome is uh, being presented as light and change, but so it was. Uh, yes, there's a comparison of French and English. Uh, a young French teenager has far more savoir faire than a young Englishman of the same age or of even older. Now, I think this kind of fusion of Austen was certainly approved. From time to time, um, the narrator steps aside and has a passage in praise of nature. It is singular I should have felt this influence at such a moment. It appears to me that those who, from feeling too strongly, have learned to consider too deeply, become less sensible to the works of art and more alive to nature. Are there not times when we turn with indifference from the finest picture or statue, the most improving book, the most amusing poem, and when the very commonest and everyday views of nature, a soft evening, a lovely landscape, the moon riding in her glory through a clouded sky without forcing or asking attention sink into our hearts. They do not console, they sometimes add poignancy to pain, but still have a power, and generally speak in vain, they become a part of us. I think Fanny Price would certainly agree with that. There are, of course, less enjoyable travel moments, uh, and sometimes the, the narrator has a bit of a, a complaint about it. But as she philosophically concludes, as there was no possibility of relief, I resign myself to my faith and it's even amused. And the, the style in which they travelled was extraordinary. And in truth, as far as paying well and scolding well can go, it's impossible to travel more magnificently more à la milieu anglais than we do. There's also less, uh, less edifying sites. So uh, in Italy, the narrator finds that some of the jobs that by then in England were being done by steam power were still being done by humans, such as powering treading rocks uh, to spin silk. I saw in a huge horizontal wheel about a dozen of these poor creatures labouring so hard that my very heart ached to see them, and I begged that the machine might be stopped, that I might speak to them. Compassion is wasted upon such creatures, said R, whoever R was. That's another of these mysterious people. Now, we also get quite a lot of witty, witty observations from our narrator. Uh, I am told that Florence retains its reputation of being the most devout capital in Italy, and that here love, music, and devotion hold divided empire, or rather our tria junta in uno. Now, that's kind of a reference to the Holy Trinity of Christianity. Um, later on, Anna would become so respectable that there was no way she was joking about serious matters such as the Trinity, but in this work she did. She didn't like the Dutch painters. The Dutch and Flemish painters, in spite of their exquisite pots and pans and cabbages and carrots, 
and birch brooms in which you can count every twig, and their carpets in which you can reckon every thread, do not interest me. The landscapes too, however, natural, are mere Dutch nature, with some brilliant exceptions. Fat cattle, clipped trees, boars, and windmills. Of course, I'm not speaking of Van Dyke, nor of Rubens, uh, nor of Rembrandt, but for my own part, I would give up all that Maris, Netscher, Tenniers, and Edward Dow ever produced for one of Claude's even like creations or one of Guido's lovely heads. So that's how taste has changed somewhat since uh, her time. She's also a bit of a name dropper. She meets someone who knew the Empress Josephine, and so we hear all about it. Then they're in, New, uh, in Switzerland, and I've just included this as a specimen of how her um, poetry had improved since she was nine, <laughs> not surprisingly. Uh, so she gives a poem about Lausanne, but she's not very happy with Lausanne. Again, like at Saint-Germain, too many people, it's too hot, it's too annoying. Now, blessed forever be that heaven's sprung art which can transport us in its magic power. From all the turmoil of the busy crowd, from the gay haunts where pleasure is adored, Mid the hot, sickening glare of pomp and light, and fashion worshipped by a gaudy throng of heartless idlers, from the jarring world and all its passions, follies, cares, and crimes, and fits us gaze, even in the city's heart, on such a scene as this, on a fairest spot. I found this a really interesting comparison. Um, the, the narrator, Anna, or Anna as the narrator, says that she is permitted by her quiet and her silence to pass unobserved, but to observe uh, everyone around her. And she, she, that's a kind of freedom that she is not subject to being observed herself. And we can compare, I think, a very famous passage written by Mary Russell Midford in a letter of 1815 about Austen. So Anna says, People are so accustomed to my pale face, languid indifference, and what M, again, who's M, calls my impractical silence, but after the first glance and introduction, I believe they are scarcely sensible of my presence. So I sit and look and listen, secure and hard in my apparent dullness. And memorably, unforgettably, Mary Russell Whitford said about Austin, till pride and prejudice showed what precious gem was hidden in that unbending case, she was no more regarded in society than a poker or a fire screen. The case is very different now. She is still a poker, but a poker of whom everybody is afraid. <laughs> Rome, at last, Roma. We dispatched, as L, again, who's L, would say a good, good deal today. We visited the Temple of Vesta, the Church of Santa Maria in Cosmodino, the Temple of Fortune, the Ponte Rotto, and the House of Nicola Rienzi. All these lie together in a dirty, low, and disagreeable part of Rome. Then we drove to the Pyramid of Caius Cestus. That's the Ponte Rotto, which means the Broken Bridge, still there. And the most climactic episode in the whole book, is the visit to Vesuvius. Now, this was actually a standard part of the Grand Tour. And so um, you had great ladies, such as Lady Vesper, um, who, in the generation prior, had collected lava from the side of Vesuvius. Um, Sir Humphrey Davy, the great scientist, collected crystals and, uh, in 1815, uh, and it was definitely part of the whole Grand Tour experience. Now, Anna gives a very detailed account which I'm going to treat in some, uh, some detail because it, it is the climax of the book. We set out at seven in the evening in an open carriage, and almost the whole way we had the mountain before us spouting fire to a prodigious height. The road was crowded with groups of people who had come out from the city, that's Naples, and environs to take a nearer view of the magnificent spectacle, and numbers were hurrying to and fro in the sort of flying hurricane, which are peculiar to Naples. As we approached, the explosions became more and more vivid, and at every tremendous burst of fire, our friend L jumped half of his seat, making most loud and characteristic exclamations. By Jove, magnificent fellow! Now for a whiz, there he goes, sky high by George! The rest of the party were equally enthusiastic in a different style, and I sat silent and quiet from absolute inability to express what I felt. I was almost breathless with wonder, and excitement and impatience to be near the scene of action. So this is Turner's view of the serious erupting. And throughout this whole romantic period, fortunately, for the romantic painters and writers, the serious was in a very active phase. 
At this time, the eruption was at its extreme height. The column of fire was from a quarter to a third of a mile high, and the stones were thrown up to the height of a mile and a quarter. I passed close to a rock about four feet in diameter, which had rolled down some time before. It was still red hot, and I stopped to warm my hands at it. At a short distance from it lay another stone or rock, also red hot, but six times the size. I walked on first with Salvador. Sidebar, Salvador was a real person. He was a very famous guide, again, at this time. And so by putting this reference to a real person in, um, Anna's adding gross similitude to the story. Till we were within a few yards of the lava. At this moment, a prodigious stone, followed by two or three smaller ones, came rolling down upon us with terrific velocities. The gentlemen and guides all ran. <laughs> My first impulse was to run too, but Salvador had called, called on me to stop and see what direction the stone would take. I saw the reason of his advice and stopped. In less than a second, he seized my arm and turned me back. Five, six yards. I heard the whizzing sound of the stone as it rushed down behind me. A little further on, it met with the impediment against which it bolted with such force that it flew up into the air to a great height and fell in a shower of red hot fragments. All this passed in a moment. I have shuddered since when I thought of that moment, but at the time, I saw the danger without the slightest sensation of terror. I remember the ridiculous figures of the men as they scrambled over the ridges of Scoria. So Anna's powers of description uh, come to the fore in this, in this account. And it's also a, a gendered account, basically it's the men who are afraid. She's not even afraid. She's also like a citizen scientist, taking note of the size of the, the rocks and so on. So you must be thinking right now, so where exactly is the scandal in the scandalous diary? Okay, well, there's a couple of aspects to it. The very end of the um, book, we read, four days after the date of the last paragraph, the writer died at our palm in her 26th year and was buried in the garden of the Capuchin Monastery near that city. But it quickly became evident that the writer wasn't dead and she wasn't an invalid. And uh, Henry Grove Robinson, who was quite the critic at the time, was totally appalled. Red walking what I've since finished, a diary of an ennoyé, amusing gossip, the affected sentimentality of a pretended invalid, very disgusting. A young woman in good health and at her ease pretends to be suffering and even dying of grief. Disappointed affections, and we have an account of the author's death. But it's also, there was also a bit of the fact that it was a bit disingenuous. So early on, the narrator says this about Madame de Jean-Lee's diary. Uh, now, if my poor little diary should ever be seen, I tremble but to think of it. What egotism and vanity, what discontent, repining caprice, should I be accused of? And as I mentioned earlier, what, what, what Jameson was doing with this book was fictional diary. It, it was um, groundbreaking. And Mary Shelley, who wasn't, you know, she was pretty much a groundbreaker herself, but she couldn't, she, she thought there was too much slippage between fact and fiction in what Jameson was doing. So that's, that's how groundbreaking it was, that even a, a forward-thinking critic um, couldn't really cover it. There is one, one more aspect to the scandal. At various times, and this is, I suppose, in keeping with the narrator uh, from the winds of beauty is that sort of chivalrous kind of tone. There's a kind of a knowing mood in some of the things that the narrator says about um, but what are clearly sexual matters. Uh, and so obviously for, for males to do the grand tour, they would have acquired a knowledge of classical, um, fairly sexual texts from their education. But women weren't supposed to have that knowledge. And so, but the narrator, knows all about Dino and Aeneas, and there's a scene in which um, they're together in a cave, and you can imagine what happens, and she indicates she knows what happens. Catullus was quite a um, raunchy poet, and she says she knows his poetry. She mentions Antinous, who was the same-sex lover of the Emperor Hadrian. So obviously she's saying, I know about this as well. Uh, and finally, there's a long passage where she goes to the theatre, somewhere in Italy, uh, and it's a performance of uh, a play by this Italian Alfieri about Mira. Now, Mira is a character in Greek mythology who falls in love with her father. So the theme is incest. And so these were things that women writers were not supposed to indicate they had any knowledge of. But she just 
did. I'm going to hit. <laughs> so, but the real scandal was that she was a governess pretending to be a woman of leisure. So most of the ladies of the Grand Tour were either the, the highest of aristocrats, like Bess Foster, like the uh, Duchess of Devonshire, uh, or Lady Mary Mont Wortley Montague up the top there, Helen Maria Williams, uh, was very much an upper middle class person. Madame de Seille was very much of the diplomat class. The real scandal was that a working governess assumed the persona of a woman of pleasure. Now, after the book came out, um, her husband Robert went uh, to Canada and he was Attorney General of what was called Upper Canada, based in Toronto. Uh, and this is a portrait from the um, National Library of Quebec. As we already noted, the marriage didn't work. Um, but he felt that it would be important for Anna to come over um, for his career, at least to show herself. Um, so she did. She hated it. She did get a book out of it, however. <laughs> she hated the Toronto winter. She was stuck in a room and she was translating um, various plays and essays from German. But yeah, she got another travel book out of it. Winter Studies and Summer Rambles in Canada. Now, by this time, by the 1840s, travel was changing. The Grand Tour as such was dead, but travel was being democratised. And Jameson was very positive about this. She, she did look back, she looked forward. Um, of course, there were, as there always are, people who were concerned that there was too much tourism, sites were going to get overrun, this is you know, nothing new. But Anna felt that if managed properly, this new wave of tourism could be a good thing. And she was quite, she was prepared to be a guide in her books for people who would not necessarily have had any education, but wanted to know what they were looking at in the great museums and galleries in Italy. And she didn't talk down to the reader. She expects the reader to come along with her knowledgeable observations. And but of course, as I mentioned before with the Dutch, she's always some very strong views. The style of the Caravaggio and Guercino school, with their abrupt lights and shadows, their light upon dark and dark upon light, may be very effective and exciting, but to my taste, it is tricky and vulgar in comparison to the Venetian style, and she means of Titian and Raphael. It is like an epigram compared with a lyric, or a melodrama compared with an epic poem. So this is one of those light and shade Caravaggios that she wasn't so fussed on. Now, her magnum opus uh, was Sacred and Legendary Art, which came out in four big volumes. And uh, let's not forget that Jonas was entirely self-educated. She totally educated herself about the history of art, uh, about the history of all the biblical and legendary references in the art. Uh, and yeah, it was a hugely popular set of works. It's kind of very Victorian. It's very ponderous. So it's a bit of an acquired taste, so for the legend around that. But the, the volumes continued selling in huge numbers right until the, into the 20th century. And she was the acknowledged authority in Britain uh, on Christian art, which is a huge achievement for a, a self-educated governess. And the New York Times, in the year of her death, 1860, wrote, Mrs. Jameson has done probably more than any other writer to familiarise the public mind with the principles of art. And so to arrive at full Victorian authority was a very far cry from the cheeky, witty and subversive young woman whose 1826 travel diary had caused such a stir. So here I've just got some further reading. Um, a lot of her works are, are available on Google Books uh, or in reprint editions. Uh, and I can recommend Augustus Hare, Walks in Rome. It's just, it's something I read when I just need it. When I can't travel, I need a bit of comfort literature, I'll turn to Augustus Hare. There have been a couple of biographies. Um, Clara Thomas was the earlier one. Judith Johnston's an Australian writer who's written a biography of Anna Jameson. So, that's for further reading, and thank you very much.